everyone, and thank you for joining our Zoom Live today on nutrient absorption. My name is Brianna, and I am with Victor Kilo. I will be your moderator today. Victor Kilo provides an array of services such as brand management, web design and development, business transformation, social media, and live event support. So throughout this um, live, there will be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have any questions throughout, please utilize that button to ask them. You, your name will be kept anonymous. I am happy to introduce our speakers today, Kate from Dallas Therapy and Grace from LifeStart. So Grace is a registered dietitian, nutritionist, certified health coach, and NASM certified personal trainer. She has a passion for educating others on nutrition and teaching her clients how to properly fuel their bodies through creating a healthy relationship with food. She helps her clients achieve the health goals through developing lasting lifestyle habits. She has been with LifeStart for almost five years and loves helping people reach their full potential. You can reach Grace at nutrition at lifestart.net or you can purchase a virtual nutrition session on LifeStart's, but, uh, LifeStart's website. So for those of you who don't know, LifeStar exists to engage and motivate the corporate workforce. They create customized, compelling environments where employees can exercise, relax, and socialize with their colleagues. Now they've gone virtual. LifeStar at Home is accessible from anywhere. Their virtual programming includes one-on-one -on -one training, live group exercise classes, individualized nutrition counseling, nutrition webinars, and fun experience workshops for the whole family. At LifeStart, they believe in transforming the workplace through wellness because everyone deserves to reach their fullest potential to live life well. Thank you for being with us, Grace. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. And Kate has been a Dell's therapist for five years. She is primarily based in Chicago. Stemming from her love of dance, Kate works to see that her clients move how they want to move and without limitation. She enjoys sharing what she learns with her clients and is grateful to be a part of a creative and driven team in the health and wellness industry. For those of you who don't know, Dallas Therapy is a precise, innovative therapy for chronic pain, muscle stiffness, and athletic injuries where the pressure is applied to the entire length of the muscle. It is based on the science of three-dimensional micro-stretching for muscular fibers that are causing symptoms of pain and stiffness. Results include the elimination of tightness, restored muscle health for optimal athletic performance, and real painful pain relief. And we are proud to serve the Chicagoland area. So thank you for being with us, Kate. Thanks so much. I'm excited. Great. So my, without further ado, let's jump in. My first question will be for Grace. Um, how does new, the absorption of nutrients and water work? And how does our body utilize um, the distribution of the nutrients from our food? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so we'll kind of go through, it can get very detailed and specific. So we're going to kind of get an overview of it. But so our body essentially has these different specific methods and pathways for breaking down our different macronutrients and micronutrients into molecules that our bodies are able to absorb, to use for energy and other kind of processes. So going back real quick, macronutrients are our nutrients that give us calories. So those include our carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Now our micronutrients, they don't give us calories. However, they are still extremely important and have many other purposes in our body. So our micronutrients include things like the vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. So our foods typically will have a combination of macro and micronutrients. So for example, if you have like an apple, an apple is going to be mostly carbohydrates, a lot of water. Um, so macro or carbohydrates being a macronutrient, but we, it also contains micronutrients such as vitamin C and potassium. So it's rare that you'll be eating one thing and you're only getting one macro or micronutrients. It's typically a combination of everything. So going in to kind of how our body absorbs those things, we'll just do a quick overview of the digestive system and how our body absorbs these different nutrients. So our food is broken down through both a mechanical and chemical process. So nutrients are then absorbed through the digestive tract through either diffusion or active transport to be used in the body. So essentially we have our, those macronutrients and then we need to break them down into smaller molecules that our body can actually utilize. 
So we start by chewing our food and that's gonna be our mechanical breakdown. And then our saliva actually has an enzyme in it called salivary amylase. What this is, it's a the chemical breakdown. So this is where we're initiating that process of breaking our carbohydrates into smaller molecules, uh, such as simple sugars. When we swallow our food, then it goes down our esophagus and there's another uh, mechanical process called peristalsis, which essentially is just shimmying the food down into our stomach. Um, so once our food arrives in our stomach, our stomach releases hydrochloric acid and other digestive juices that are gonna continue that chemical breakdown of food. And there's a little mechanical process in there too. So this mixture, once it leaves the stomach, is called chyme, and it moves into our small intestine next. So in the small intestine, this is where we'll have enzymes from our pancreas and our liver coming in and continue to break that food mixture down again into smaller and smaller, more absorbable items. So we have in our the lining of the small intestine, there are these little villi or microvilli. So there's kind of finger-like projections that go along the lining. And what it does is it allows a much larger surface area. So if you were to actually just stretch out the entire microvilli um, and lining of our small intestine, it would be about the size of a football field. So this is what's allowing our body to absorb um, much more of those nutrients more efficiently because we have more surface area. So majority of our nutrients are going to be absorbed there in the small intestine um, through that diffusion or active transport I mentioned earlier. And this is where water is going to be essential for that diffusion process. So through diffusion, water and water-soluble substances move across the barriers, so are able to go through that surface area. Now glucose, which is our, um, what carbohydrates get broken down into, amino acids, which is what our proteins are broken down into, glycerol, which is what our fatty acids are broken down into, and then we have our water-soluble water -soluble vitamins and minerals. So those are all going to go through that, um, that diffusion transport or diffusion process. So from here, these nutrients are going to enter the bloodstream, go into the liver in order to be processed or to deliver to other parts of the body. Now the fats, those, so Fats are gonna be a little bit different. They require a few more extra steps in order before they'll reach the liver. But now, so we've gotten through our small intestine. Next, the remaining mixture is gonna go into our large intestine. Um, this is where our body is responsible for reabsorbing water, sodium, potassium, and vitamin K. And then it actually takes the stool and solidify, or takes that waste and solidifies it into a stool. And then that's where we excrete it through our rectum. So going back a little bit just into the nutrient absorption and relating it to our muscles, our muscles then can help to store energy um, from glucose in the form of glycogen. Now muscles are unique in the sense that they're not going to export that energy to other areas or other organs of the body. So they're going to use it specifically for muscle activity. And then when those energy stores are diminished or become depleted, muscle contractions weaken. So that's where you'll start to feel that kind of muscle fatigue you don't have quite that same sprint. Um, you don't, having it more difficult to, to lift those heavy weights um, is due to not having that energy there. So our muscles then can use an alternate fuel source um, to give us a little more energy. So that's kind of a big, big overview, big picture of what's happening with our nutrient absorption. Yeah, thank you for breaking that down for us. That's awesome. So how does this nutrient absorption, um, Kate, tie into muscle tightness? Yes. So, um, so one idea or one piece of this whole process that is uh, often not talked about is the next step. So um, obviously there are a lot of really specific um, and a lot of things that happen through the process of digestion for your body to break down to get the components that it needs. Um, but the question uh, that we think is interesting is what happens after those molecules and nutrients get dropped off into the muscles, into the organs and the lymph, right? So ideally, everything would be dropped off into the right area. It can be transported or transformed by the working cells if needed. Um, you know, if they're dispersed and if they can basically get to where they need to go, right? But uh, recent research shows that fascia is another structure or another component uh, to consider when looking at um, nutrient dispersion and how effective it is. Um, so a little, a little breakdown, fascia, what in the world is that? Um, fascia is connective tissue. It surrounds all of our internal organs and our muscles. Um, it is uh, one of the first, um, one of the first um, structures that gives shape to your developing anatomy in um, embryology. 
um, and over a lifetime, it's, it uh, generates and, and adapts to create an environment for our cells uh, to function as we go through the process of living, using our bodies, um, you know, and as our cellular metabolisms um, kind of fluctuate. So you can kind of think of it as a roadmap um, and an enabler for your cells that utilize these, these nutrients that we give to them. Um, you know, it shapes, uh, it shapes the environment uh, for growth and for development. Um, it funnels water through your anatomy, through your muscles to help with hydration. Um, it's a huge player in uh, reparative processes. So in wound healing, um, and it's just like it's it's often the connector between a lot of these these mechanisms that we study individually. Um, so, in a healthy state, so okay, so then then what, right? So what is what is healthy fascia, and then what is what is um, maybe dysfunctional or what is problematic fascia, and what does that look like? So, in a healthy state, fascia is pliable, it's soft, um, it can it's a net like structure, so it can extend in multiple directions. Um, it can also fully contract uh, uh, uniformly. Um, in a dysfunctional state, uh, fascia will feel hard, um, which you can test for yourself at home by pressing into a muscle that feels achy or sore. Uh, you may feel a bit of hardness or resistance there. Um, so that's an indication that the fascia and that underlying muscle tissue is not at its healthiest state. Um, and it may be inhibiting nutrient flow through the tissue if that's something that you're looking to um, to like make more of. <laughs> um, so, uh, so there's a couple of ways that fascia can become stuck or dysfunctional uh, or hard, right? So if our goal is to make it pliable and to make um, all of these nutrients available, how do we get it there? So uh, the first, uh, the first and, and one of the most common things that we see in clinic is that normal wear and tear um, from our lifetime, uh, it's accumulation of, of movements, postures, training, form, all of the shapes that you've been making and all of the activities that you've been doing over, um, over a lifetime um, have been essentially solidified, right? Um, because your body adapts to make the movements that you make uh, as efficient as possible and fascia does that for you. Um, so that kind of like internal patterning um, coupled with um, chronic low grade inflammation, um, which uh, you can get from, I mean, there are so many things that create uh, inflammation. Uh, one of those things are, um, you know, uh, poor diet choices. Uh, so the, the combination can create a fibrosis um, or a scarring within the fascial tissue over time. And what this fibrosis can do is it can create stiff pockets of fascia that can start to uh, hold metabolic waste like uh, lactic acid. Um, and other metabolic byproducts, uh, it can hold those stagnant around nerve endings, um, which can generate soreness, uh, prolonged aches. Um, if you've ever heard of, or like myself, um, <laughs> have experienced delayed onset muscle soreness, you know, where you're sore for days or so after a hard workout. Um, a lot of that is, is on account of the, a lot of the irritating aspect of that is, is uh, by account of the lactic acid um, irritating those nerve receptors. Um, now, on the flip side, uh, these fibrotic sections of tissue can also act like a wall or a barrier, um, or I like to kind of think of like a dam. Um, so it'll act like a barrier around the muscles and the organs that it contains. Um, so it will block out access um, to cells like immune cells, and it can block out access um, of nutrients into that anatomy. Um, Fascial researchers have also started to examine that immune cells utilize the extracellular matrix, or also known as fascia, um, to navigate to the site of trouble, um, and that the level of fascial stiffness plays a role in developing pathologies like um, cancer and liver cirrhosis, or uh, internal scarring of the liver. Um, Another way <laughs> that, uh, that uh, fascia can become uh, kind of like stuck and bound and start to limit uh, absorption is um, through dehydration, right? So we often have clients that say, I drink tons of water, but I still feel stiff. What is going on? Please help me. Um, so these folks may be drinking the recommended amounts of water, uh, but they're still actually dehydrated because the water can't get to where it needs to go. 
Um, so dehydration or the lack of water draws the, uh, the gluey kind of sticky surfaces of collagen uh, together, right? So kind of similar to paper mache, you know, you kind of like layer and glue <laughs> all of these sheets together, right? So over time you have um, this like combined um, like thick sheet of collagen, um, which obviously uh, the more bound it is, the less water that there's there. Um, it's just, it's stuck, right? So water can't get into it, right? So um, we found that shearing forces increase um, what's called a uh, protoglycan, uh, specifically hyaluronic acid, also found in um, uh, skin care, right? Not just great for your skin, also great uh, for your muscular health, right? So at points of friction during shearing, right? So when you're pulling those, those, um, those sheets apart, um, the hyaluronic acid, uh, acts like a magnetic balloon. Um, so it kind of creates space between the collagen layers and also draws water into the site. Um, so this kind of creates the space, holds the space, and then it draws water in, um, to rehydrate the tissue and reopen avenues for, uh, water and nutrients to flow. And then the final, um, thing that I'd like to talk about that creates, um, uh, stiff um, problematic uh, fascia <laughs> are uh, advanced glycation end products. Um, and I know that we talked about these a little bit during our um, intermittent fasting conversation. Um, as a recap, they are the byproduct of uh, refined sugars. Um, it creates problematic non-enzymatic cross-linking to the collagen proteins. Um, your body creates both enzymatic and then you have these non-enzymatic uh, uh, crosslinks that occur. Um, so the non-enzymatic crosslinking uh, is really difficult for your body to get rid of on its own. So the long life uh, of collagen proteins combined with high glucose or high uh, blood sugar levels um, promotes um, and develop uh, advanced glycation end product formation. Uh, so essentially what this does uh, at a very just kind of like non-scientific levels, it acts like cement <laughs> into your fascia. Um, like I said, they're really difficult for your body to get rid of, um, and they are certainly problematic. Uh, they can alter enzymatic signaling, um, and then they can further drive processes of uh, inflammation that would then contribute to the development of um, like diabetes, for example. Um, so as you can imagine, any one <laughs> or combination of these events um, can create inefficiencies, inefficiencies in your fashion and in your body uh, in the utilization of water and nutrients. Um, so while there are many components to pain and, um, and to nutrition, it's not a far reach to anticipate that some of the difficulty in uh, nutrient absorption or hydration may be within the fascial tissue uh, itself. Nice. So then from a nutritional standpoint, what can I do to increase my body's ability to absorb and utilize, um, you know, everyday nutrients? What kind of food should I eat? Is juicing the solution? Yeah, another great question. So first is just thinking consistency. So we want to make sure that if you eat a single salad, it's not going to be enough nutrients over the week, the month, anything like that. So thinking, being able to take a step back and look at what is your diet looking like for most of the time. So first thing, consistently eating that well-balanced diet is, can be the best approach to make sure that we have enough nutrients. So aiming for at least two servings of fruit per day and two to three servings of vegetables is a good general goal for most adults. And we also want to make sure within that we're eating a variety of different fruits and vegetables. So the different colors are going to have different nutrient profiles. So for example, our red and orange um, fruits and vegetables have a lot of vitamin A. Our green veggies are going to have lots of B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, iron. So we really just need to focus on getting that eating the rainbow um, and not just Skittles, <laughs> but eating the rainbow of our produce to get all those different nutrients. Now, thinking then to another way or another kind of practical approach of eating a well-balanced diet is if you take your plate. So you take your plate and cut it in half, and we want half of our plate to be that produce. Most, about two-thirds of that half to be our non-searchy vegetables, and then the other third to be a serving of fruit. Now, this is going to help to just, again, encourage that we're intaking enough of these different vitamins and minerals. 
taking a look at our other half of the plate, if we cut it in half, then we'll have a quarter of our plate. This is what we want to focus on our leaner sources of protein. Um, and we'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about inflammation too, which Kate had mentioned previously, because um, the foods that we eat can have a big inflammatory response. So we want to try and focus on more leaner sources of protein. Um, those are going to be things like, um, kind of a fun way to remember it, is less legs, less fat. And the more fat there is, the more inflammation response we'll have. So that's where focusing on fatty fish or like leaner white fishes, uh, chicken, turkey, and then leaner sources of our red meats. Um, incorporating vegetarian sources of protein as well, things like um, tofu or other soy products, legumes, so all of our different kind of beans can be really beneficial. All right, so going back to our plate, we have half fruits and vegetables, a quarter of protein, and then a quarter we want more of our quality carbohydrates. So this is where, too, when we're thinking from an inflammation response, if we're eating really highly processed things, it can lead to more of that inflammation. So we want to focus on our carbs to be more um, quality, meaning that they have more fiber in them. So focusing on your whole grains, our starchy vegetables, so things like potato, corn, and peas, even though they're vegetables, we're actually going to count them more in that quality carb um, on our plate because they have more of those carbohydrates in them. Um, this is where to just trying to make those little swaps of swapping from like white pasta to whole wheat pasta or white rice to brown rice can help to reduce that inflammation and be more anti-inflammatory. Um, but portion size is still going to be important there. So just because now you're eating brown rice doesn't mean you should have half of your plate to be brown, brown rice. So that portion size will be important. And then we have um, our smallest portion is going to be healthy fats on the plate. If you think of your plate now, like just a little circle being those healthy fats. Um, the reason fats just have more calories compared to carbs and protein. So the portion size tends to be smaller, but we want to try and focus more on our plant-based healthy fats like nuts and seeds, avocado, um, non-tropical oils that are liquid at room temperature. So things like extra virgin olive oil or avocado oil can be great. And then this is where to, um, our fatty fish can count towards those fats and then that lean protein there as well. So I always encourage clients to try and include as many vegetables whenever possible and really think of ways that you can sneak it into the main course of your meal. So not just thinking kind of the standard American diet where it's the meat, potato, veggie, like how can you make the veggie an integral part of that main? So that way it's not just, oh, well, I didn't have vegetables and I'm going to forget it. So something to just kind of um, keep in mind and when you find a recipe, maybe doubling it for the amount of vegetables. It's always a good rule of thumb. Um, this is where two, eating a well-balanced diet can help promote a good gut microbiome, which I could spend probably like hours and hours talking about our gut health. And there's so much we don't know about it, which is really interesting. Um, but we want to, our gut is going to have an impact on our digestive track. It's going to have an impact on our immune. It actually has been linked to anxiety and depression. So it's really important that we're getting that well-balanced diet. So we want to try and include more probiotics as well. And probiotics are live bacteria and they come from different fermented foods. So things like yogurt, kimchi, miso, um, kefir, which is like a drinkable yogurt, um, sauerkraut are all examples. And then prebiotics are the food that the probiotics feed on. And those are going to be a lot of those fiber rich foods. So when I mentioned our quality carbohydrates, those are going to fall in that category of fruits and vegetables. Um, our whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes will all often have a good source of that prebiotic to again promote that good gut health. Now your question um, regarding juicing. So juicing can certainly be beneficial to help reach your micronutrient need, but it's not the only approach. And one of the things we want to think of is, um, and part of the reason that if you go to like a juice stand that they can be so expensive is that it takes about two to three pounds of produce squeezed to get about a 12 ounce glass of juice. So if you think of, are you going to eat two to three pounds of produce? Probably not in one sitting, whereas drinking a glass of juice can be an easier approach there. So it's something that we do just want to be mindful of. You can certainly include it, but we don't want it to be our only intake of fruits and vegetables. We still want to make sure that we're getting the fruits and vegetables in. If we were just to be drinking the juice, then we're lacking in that fiber. Um, it, if you were to do like a juice cleanse, then you're definitely not getting fiber, protein, or fat. And then that can lead to other kind of detrimental things to your health. So you can incorporate it as um, part of your routine, but also, again, still thinking of how can we get that well-balanced diet. 
Now, another area too, kind of along those same lines is thinking of supplements. So supplements can be another way to kind of fill in the cracks and encourage those consistent intake of nutrients. But I never want my clients to think of, oh, I ate a multivitamin, so I don't need to eat any fruits and vegetables today. So they should really be kind of a supplement you even use the term, the supplement to what you're currently eating. And supplement use can be very individualized to the person. Um, supplements also aren't tightly regulated by the FDA, so I always encourage um, my clients to do their research to make sure the quality that they're purchasing is actually what they think they're getting, because again, supplements similar to juicing can be kind of expensive. So I recommend working with a dietitian or a doctor to find what supplements you might need. Um, but I did, Kate, you brought up a good point when talking about inflammation. Um, going into inflammation with like um, muscles too, but inflammation is going to be that underlying cause of many of our chronic diseases. So you had mentioned diabetes, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome. Essentially what it is, is it's putting this additional stress in our body that we don't want. <laughs> so it's also actually going to have a big effect on our digestive system. So as I talked about before, those little microvilli, having eating more inflammatory promoting foods can actually shorten those down and make it so it's more difficult for our body to digest the food, more difficult for us to absorb those different nutrients. So you might be consuming the food, but if your body can't take that food in and break it down to those specific nutrients and utilize them, then consuming them, we're not getting the benefits that we're expecting to. So kind of going a little bit more in detail, um, Kate had mentioned that our like, refined sugars are gonna promote inflammation. So our really highly refined and processed foods will definitely promote inflammation. So those sugars, sugar sweetened beverages, um, kind of your stereotypical desserts, cakes, cookies, pastries, um, saturated fat. So that little fun, less legs, less fat. That means more legs, more saturated fat. So that's where you wanna be a little more mindful of focusing on those leaner proteins when we can. Um, and then trans fats and fried foods, those are also going to be um, promote inflammation and same with alcohol. So this is where really trying to focus on consuming that well-balanced diet can help to promote more in uh, that anti-inflammatory response. And that's where getting those heart healthy fats can be really helpful. Encouraging lots of fiber can be great there as well. So really kind of looking at it as a full, like taking a step back, looking at the full balanced approach, as opposed to getting like very specific into like one or two nutrients here and there. Just thinking consistency overall is gonna help us to ensure that we're intaking enough nutrients for our body to be able to utilize. Awesome. So then from a therapy standpoint, if I'm doing all the things that Grace is saying, how can I help my muscles and organs better um, distribute these nutrients and water so my fascia does not get tight and sticky? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, so there's more information um, coming out about the benefits of using um, pressure into soft tissues to address um, kind of like that density, right, or the densification um, and break down areas of fibrosis. Um, you can also use shearing forces, right? So like if you're thinking of those planes, like moving across each other, um, that promotes hydration. Um, so the shearing, what we find in clinic, uh, will, will most often shear at more superficial levels. Um, whereas pressure addresses more of the deeper areas of tightness. Um, so a general rule of thumb is, um, you know, if um, you can apply an accurate uh, and strategic application of force uh, into the tight and sensitive uh, areas, you know, ones that are bound up and hard, um, you can compound that over a short period of time. Excuse me, uh, which is what we do um, in clinic. Um, uh, we can restructure that fascia back into health and to supporting uh, the connecting systems. Um, so benefits, um, if you are just isolating uh, and looking at the fascial standpoint first, um, they've found that benefits of pressure and shearing forces can um, reduce inflammation. It can close a chronic uh, inflammatory response, um, helps to build protein or build collagen. Um, it, again, makes your movement more efficient. Um, you can resist um, degradation, you can heal wounds faster, um, you support your immune system function, um, you can draw in water and nutrients into tissues. Um, it aids in uh, GI and visceral organ function, um, and then uh, decreasing overall levels of stress. Awesome. 
Well, thank you guys so much for all this wonderful information during this session. Um, I know this was a little bit of a longer, more scientific session. So I was just wondering if you both could give me two or three main takeaways from everything today. Yeah, definitely. So from a nutrition standpoint, as I just summarized, really focusing on that consistency and looking at the big picture. So asking yourself, what am I doing most of the time? Really trying to encourage to bring more color to your plate whenever possible, because eating that rainbow, making sure that we're getting that different variety of food. So a little thing I'll always challenge most clients and even myself to do, every time I go to the store, pick up a different fruit and vegetable so you're not just getting in the same rut and routine. So take your plate, cut it in half, have some vegetable order, quality carbs, fiber, and a little bit of healthy fat. So a general approach to how you can build um, your plate. And then finally, staying hydrated. Um, Kate talked about it a lot. I didn't dive too much into it, but our body is made up of so much water. We need to make sure staying hydrated for everything to be functioning properly. So the old kind of eight, eight ounce glasses is a little too cookie cutter. So a good approach is to take half of your body weight and drink that many ounces per day. So if you weigh 150 pounds, aim for 75 ounces of water per day. And again, kind of general rule of thumb, it's 100 degrees outside and you're sweating a lot more, you're losing a lot, you might need more water at that point, but a good place to start. Wonderful, thank you. Right on. Uh, yeah, and to, to kind of um, bounce off of what uh, Grace was saying, you know, in the same way that a single whole food, whole food meal um, or, or a healthy meal doesn't constitute a necessarily a healthy diet, uh, you know, a daily bout of exercise does not necessarily constitute uh, a healthy movement plan for your muscles. You know, um, it's good to question, you know, are your self-care, your at-home tricks um, and ways that you're recovering, are those actually effective in creating um, pliability for yourself? Um, you know, is your pain decreasing? Are you, or are you finding that you're actually needing to stretch and foam roll and do more and more uh, to get any sort of relief? Um, so you are what you eat, but you are also what you move, right? So a good rule of thumb um, that I like to kind of keep in mind is move it or lose it, right? So if the tissue can't move, consider that it might not fully be using the water and the nutrients that you're trying to give it um, with what Grace outlined. So you can use pressure and shear from a fascial standpoint to break down those fibrotic and stuck sections. Um, and that will help your body to fully uh, distribute and utilize um, the tips that Grace gave us. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, before we dive into questions, for those of you who are visual learners and watching, I did want to play two brief videos um, describing LifeStar and Dell's therapy. So we will start with LifeStar. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. And now we'll share Dallas's. Dallas therapy is a precise, innovative therapy that is based on the science of three-dimensional micro-stretching and separating of the affected muscle fibers. Instead of stretching the ends apart, pressure is applied directly into the tightness at multiple angles 
breaking up that tightness to restore uniformity and pliability to the entire muscle. In addition, this pressure breaks down the excessive collagen in the fascia, allowing its realignment. The benefits of Delos therapy include elimination of tightness, restored range of motion, strength, flexibility and power, and real pain relief. To experience our innovative therapy, contact Delos Therapy. Okay, so um, I know we are a little bit over time, but I did want to um, take one of these questions that we got and just kind of ask um, for both of your takes on this. Um, I guess we can start with Grace. How does absorption tie into healing? Yeah, that's a great question. So essentially at any given time, there are so many different processes that are happening in our body. And so when it comes to recovery and healing, protein is going to be important. Um, protein is going to help with growth and repair. We kind of associate protein a little bit more with like muscle building and which is 100% accurate, but also when it comes to healing and recovery, it's going to be very important. Now, the macronutrient that often gets um, fallen off there is carbohydrates are going to be important too. So especially when it comes to your muscles and recovery, carbs are going to act as kind of that lock and key to allow your muscle to take that protein in to initiate that muscle repair. Um, so in that case, carbs and protein are going to be very important from the macronutrient standpoint. Now from the micronutrient standpoint, we have so many of the different um, vitamins and minerals that are gonna play a role in that. And that's where it's important mostly to get the um, to get that variety. Because we don't wanna just say, oh, you just need vitamin A for this. Well, you actually need vitamin A, the B vitamins, vitamin C for, the list goes on and on, just to kind of help with all the different kind of healing aspects. Great, and then Kate, kind of from like a fascial standpoint. Yeah, so, uh, so we talk a lot about um, the healing mechanisms that work uh, in fascia. Um, so the same mechanism that is responsible for closing and healing a wound um, is also present in uh, um, an inflammatory response, right? So it's they, the, those two work together. Um, so this is interesting to us when we're talking about uh, diet. Um, which can promote kind of like a constant state of inflammation, right? So we know that sugars drive inflammation um, over time um, because we're looking for like long-term solutions, right? So over time, um, this in, uh, chronic inflammation can um, make epigenetic changes that actually support that state. Um, it produces, again, um, higher advanced glycation end products acting like cement. Um, it promotes cell differentiation that continue to, um, these cells actually kind of contract and they pull in the fascia around it. So it actually creates that closure. If you actually have a wound, it creates a scar if, uh, if there is no wound and it's just a, a response to the inflammation. Um, uh, so that again sets up uh, or sets in fibrosis uh, that can lay the fascial environment um, to basically set you up for developing pathologies down the road. Awesome. Well, thank you guys both so, so much for your time today. Again, for anyone that's watching, you can reach Grace from Lifestar at nutrition at lifestar.net and Kate at katedellstherapy.com um, and as well as lifestar or dellstherapy.com. So thank you guys so much for your time today. This was great. Thank, thank you, you so much. much.